Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about our Volta chip, which is, of course, the latest chip that NVIDIA has released. You've probably heard a lot about it over the course of this week and the, and the last few months. Um, it, is, it is quite an impressive beast, and so I'm going to go for a deep dive both into the macro architecture and into the micro architecture of it so that you get a feel for really what's going on inside. And I'll try and leave enough time for, for, for questions because I know it's always really useful to have a lot of interaction about, you know, to give you give the details you specifically want. So, you know, we, it's the result of, you know, four years of work and thousands of engineers worth of, of, of effort. And, and we've, we've really overhauled an enormous number of different things in this chip. We've, uh, we, we specifically targeted um, high productivity and I'll get into detail about exactly what I mean about that in, in a minute. Um, obviously the highly efficient memories uh, the, the stacked memory, HBM high bandwidth memory, is a game changer for a lot of codes because you know, the vast majority of codes are memory bandwidth limited, and so that's very exciting. New ways of getting work onto this machine, um, a new way that it executes things, and of course the tensor cores, which you may well have heard of, which are producing shockingly large numbers for, um, for, for half precision arithmetic. So first up, the Volta chip itself. It is by far the biggest thing we've ever built. It's built on 12 nanometer FinFET process at TSMC, um, 21 billion transistors, um, and, and just a ridiculous amount of threads and compute power. So you know, it is about 50% bigger, I think, than, than the biggest of our Pascal chips, but we've actually added significant efficiencies in there as well. So when you look at the raw numbers for what Volta has got, you know, in p the, the top one there is, is those tensor cores showing through, right? This is saying we're going to take the accelerating of training uh, for the 16 and 32-bit mathematical operations, and we've, got, we've gone from a 10 trillion operation per second to 120, which is just a complete transformation in the kind of things that you can do. And I'll show you some numbers about that, and I will actually go into more detail about what these are doing towards the end of this talk. Um, likewise, the same types of units accelerate inference as well as training. So this is sort of a getting at it from both sides. But it's not a slouch on the, in the 32 and 64-bit floating point either. One of these chips is 7.5 double precision teraflops. That means just over 100 of these is a petaflop machine, which is absolutely incredible if you think just about a, a, a few years ago, how you would need literally thousands of nodes to make that happen. We've boosted the memory bandwidth um, by about 20, 25%, and that's actually gone up even more, I'll show you in a moment. Um, NVLink, which is a particularly interesting thing, has gone up again by a factor of two, and more caches and uh, is also all combines to really make a huge impact on the way your codes run. So th this memory in particular, it's, it's, that's, it's an interesting beast, right? So it's, it's different to the GDDR memory that we'd used in previous chips. This showed up first on Pascal, and now we've got a, a new generation of this attached to Volta. And so not only has the clock speed gone up, but our ability to make useful work on every cycle of the clock has gone up. So where there's always bookkeeping and so on and any request into memory when, you're, when your hardware you know, asks to open pages, open lines, and so on. And that overhead in that first generation was in the neighborhood of, uh, of about 24, 25%. And so what we've done, and it was an incredible achievement if you, if, if you know about how hardware works, we've pushed that all the way up to 95%. So pretty much every single clock cycle, 19 out of 20 of every clock cycles that are requesting data from that RAM are getting it. And so where on the previous slide, as you saw, we're, we're looking at an HBM2 bandwidth of 720 gigabytes per second. The achieved bandwidth was about 76% of that. Now we're really right up there. You are seeing numbers pushing towards 900 gigabytes per second coming out of your main memory. For comparison, if you've used Kepler chips before, that means that your main memory now has the bandwidth of the cache memory on Kepler. So your entire code has accelerated to as if, as if you're running it out of cache. And the cache has expanded, of course, commensurately to create, to give you even more bandwidth into, into your SMs. <coughs> NVLink is actually probably the most exciting thing for me about all of the things that have been going on at NVIDIA in the last couple of years. It's, a, it's, it's not just an interconnect between processors. It is a 
is effectively a memory bus between processes, right? So it is a coherent memory connection where normal interconnects, you normally have to packetize things to try and get, you know, one kilobyte packets or 16 kilobyte packets or something, you know, PCI, if you're not moving 4K, it's probably not worth it. This is designed for memory size requests. So I can read and write to my neighboring GPUs with a single word of data and sustain very, very, very high throughputs on it. Not only that, of course, because it's a direct link between GPUs, it's much faster than the PCI, and that lets us build these the, the, these, these box designs, this is the, this is the layout of, of, of our DGX1 box, eight GPUs connected into four fully connected clusters of, uh, of, of NV-linked GPUs, sorry, two fully connected clusters of four NV-linked GPUs. And it means that effectively I can run these things almost like they're a single giant processor. And the, it's a game changer on the kind of algorithms I personally can write. And it's, 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 it's just it's fascinating to see the kind of things you can come out with. I mean, just think of it. It's a 300 gigabytes per second link. That means I can go GPU to GPU at the same performance as I could go to my main memory on Kepler just a couple of years ago. So not only have we beefed up the hardware, but we've really gone into programmability for this. You know, it's, it's, we're always trying to push not just more flops, but giving you the ability to get at those more flops and making it easier for you to get at them. Because sometimes programming these monsters is pretty, t is pretty hard. So what we've got, what, one of the things that we built over the last couple of years is unified memory, which is effectively memory like you would always want it to be. It's memory where I can page fault pages in and out. I don't have to manage is my memory on the CPU, is my memory on the GPU, or even between GPUs, because you know, now I've got these NV links that are very fast, so I can page my memory around between, between GPUs in the same box as well. And so you know, we've ran the spec Excel benchmark on this to say, okay, what is the difference between my hand management of my data compared with just letting the system get on with it. And you are up in the sort of the, the high 80s percentage of efficiency in exchange for doing zero work. You literally just allocate your data and say, please feel free to move this around as you want. And on this benchmark, we are pushing to 86, even 90% if we're using NVLinks, of, of the same performance of a hand-tuned multi-GPU implementation, which is mind-blowing to me again, right? Th these are the types of game changers that mean that I can get on with writing, I, my, my background CFD, I used, to, I, I used to be a physicist back in the day, and I get it, writing those codes compared to actually messing around with where my data is. Another thing we've done to get your data onto and running, filling this GPU, is this thing called multi-process service. We've, been ha we've had this for quite some time, because if you have an application which, for example, uses many MPI ranks, and you know, you've balanced it so that you've got one MPI rank per CPU core, you often might have many MPI ranks fi fitting on your GPU because they're commensurately higher performance per, per rank. And this allows me to bundle many of these ranks or many batches of, uh, of, of, of deep learning inference or ultimately multiple different smaller tasks onto a GPU and fill it efficiently. And so what we used to do with this is we'd take all of these different ranks of MPI that you had, we'd bundle them together and we'd submit them to the GPU together, and they'd all run sort of in a big pool. And so that's great if you've got a single job, but if you, as you start getting some of these smaller sharded batch jobs, what you really want is you want much better, cleaner isolation between them. And so Volta has really stepped up our ability to track and manage and isolate individual processes. So while I've got you know, seven and a half teraflops of double precision power, and you may not be using all of that. Well, in HPC, you probably are, but if you're not using all of that, then there's ways to start carving that up between processes in a much, much more clean way. We've reduced the launch latencies and we've improved the launch throughputs. And we've increased the number of clients that can fit on it as well, because obviously the size of the GPU is increased. So you've got the, the ability to really fill this machine, because you know, one giant hulking Volta is a lot of power. So that's the macro architecture side. Now I'm going to tell you about the, the micro architecture. We're going to dive a little bit closer into the SM itself and what we've done in terms of how it really executes your code, right? So all of these memories and all of these caches, they're designed to feed these things. These very hungry SMs are, uh, are streaming multiprocessors, which actually contain the threads and do all of the real work, right? So, Here's a layout of, of, of what one SM of the, of, of the GV100 Volta is. It's broken into four quadrants, 
which is very similar to how uh, the Pascal layout was as well. So we're doing effectively four simultaneous things at a time. Each one of those quadrants then has a quarter of the resources but can run uh, simultaneously 32 threads at a time. So we're running 128 simultaneous threads at any given time and they're feeding into all of these different functional units. Now, obviously the really new thing on here is these tensor cores that are sitting, on in, sitting inside of each quadrant. Notice, and as I said, I'll get into a little bit more detail about this uh, towards the end of the talk, but notice the tensor cores are a functional unit just like all of the other units. You know, when the, when the architects came and they sat down with us, I'm, I, I work in the CUDA organization, so they say, We're, we want to build this. And we say, okay, let's figure out how it makes sense from a programmer's perspective to make use of these things. The way that I want these tensor cores to work is I want them to be another arithmetic unit, like my floating point unit, like my integer op operation unit. I want to be able to dispatch work to it from my code exactly like I would any other operation. Then I can write my program in a coherent and sensible way. And so they fully connected it into the chip. And so these things are literally just another amazing piece of, of, of hardware I can issue instructions to. We've also substantially beefed up the cache, and that is, that is a, 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 a really big deal, in fact, to how m your programs will run on this device. This, this, this is where you will see significant speed ups just picking up a piece of code that ran on Volta and dropping it, sorry, on, on Pascal and dropping it on Volta. The, uh, the cache is not just bigger, but it's been significantly overhauled. I'll get to that in a moment. So, so the, the, the big new pieces on here, um, there's obviously a completely new ISA because we've got to be able to direct these tensor cores and other things as well, but we've changed the way that the threading runs. So we've got this big L1 cache that's much faster than before. We've got a completely new threading model, which I hope I'll have time to, time to get to, and of course the tensor core acceleration. So, so about that cache that I'm, I'm so excited about. In Pascal, um, and, and for those of you who, who are uh, CUDA programmers at all, you know that CUDA has this concept of shared memory, which is a sort of a user-managed cache, as well as a standard L1 cache, which you would expect uh, behaves as cache memory would. Um, and these have been separate items, right? So the L1 cache's job is to capture m memory traffic going in and out of the chip, but shared memory effectively lets me pin data into the cache so that I, if I know as a programmer that I'm going to use it a lot. So I don't want it evicted. I, 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 by, I, by hand, I manage it and copy it into place. What we've done with Volta is we've, we've, re -mer we've merged these two, two, these two together. Uh, in, in older architectures, this, this was the structure, but we've merged them in a, in a, in a somewhat different way than we used to. Um, so while we have the same set of transistors and once again, as, as if you, for those of you who use Kepler, you might remember this, you can partition the cache to say, I want more L1 cache or I want more of the user-managed shared memory, and you can, you can set that dividing line where you want, which can be very beneficial. We've actually changed the way the L1 cache behaves to really support streaming behaviors much better. And that means, for the, for the uh, architecturally inclined of, amongst us, that means I can support an unlimited number of outstanding cache misses, which means I'm not stalling my chip when all of my threads go and read randomly about memory. And that means if you're doing something like solving a graph problem or scattered, scatter gather operations, the kind of things that happen very often, you're no longer being held up by the issue rate of your request to memory and your throughput goes up. And again, it's all about getting throughput out of these cores so I can get as many threads onto this thing doing, doing work as I possibly can. <coughs> so a quick summary there, unlimited cache misses in flight, much more bandwidth, much more capacity and reunifying that storage gives you much more flexibility in how you, how you define your, your shared memory versus your cache balance in your code. And, of course, beefing up the amount of shared memory that you can have access to has been a long-standing request of our users, so you finally, you finally get access to, uh, to more than the 48K of, ca of shared memory that you were able to get before. <coughs> so, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip past this. I, I, I've, I've covered those, but the net effect on um, on applications, when you just take an existing application and you drop it onto Volta, we see for this, for this set, but th it's not just this set, and, and you can go to the Parallel for All blog and there's a whole bunch of different benchmarks that have been done, you're seeing about a 50% performance improvement straight out of the box. And that's what all of these different things add up to. And so faster caches, faster bandwidths, higher clock speeds, faster memory, all of that just means that your applications just drop it on Volta and you're looking at a 50% speed up more or less across the board, which is a pretty impressive piece of work. So 
obviously, if you're able to make use of some of the new features like the tensor core acceleration, the 16-bit um, matrix math operations that we have, you know, then you're seeing far, far, far higher speed ups. Then you can take advantage of these tensor cores and your throughput goes up by you know, hundreds of percent instead of 50 percent. And, and as I say, that, that can be a real game changer. So in the programmability side of things, probably the biggest single thing that we've done was to take the way that the GPU executes code and turn it into a much more natural multi-threading kind of execution environment. So let's see if I can cover this for you in this couple of minutes. Um, the GPU, like, 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 like many of these, these machines, likes to work with gangs of, th of threads running together because that gives us the best throughput. If, I've, if all my threads are fetching data and they're all processing the data all in lockstep, everybody's happy. But the trouble with making your threads try and gang up, and we, our, what we called a warp was 32 threads is, is what we would previously issue work through, if they're all working in lockstep, then there's things you can't do in your program. I can't take a lock, for example, on thread one and have thread two spin on it because they're all trying to do the same thing at the same time. And so there was a few awkwardnesses in the kind of programming that I could do and in the way that my threads would make forward progress or be stopped behind other threads that we always wanted to be able to break apart. So what we've done is we've made every single thread in the GPU completely independently schedulable, right? And what that means is that before Volta, I would have a 32-thread warp all pointing at the same address in memory, trying to run the same instruction. Now, the, the GPU did a bunch of clever things. You know, if I was inside an if-else clause, the people in the else would not be running this instruction. We'd have you know, masks to figure out what to run and so on. But the net effect was that all of my 32 threads were all trying to do the same thing at once. And that meant that if I had a piece of code, you know, I, I promise I'm not going to show you lots of code, but if I had a bit of code which was, had an if clause doing A, B, and then an else clause doing X and Y, then what you find is that on, on, on Pascal, or, or anything pre-Volta, A and B would all have to completely execute before I'd get to the else clause. So half my threads would be doing nothing. See, the bottom half are making forward progress, the top half are doing nothing. And then that would switch around, and the top half would make forward progress, and the bottom half would do nothing. So, there's no way to exchange data between the if and the else, else clause. I can't sit there and synchronize my threads in between. I can't affect it, which is effectively what taking a lock would be. And so that, that constrains some of the things that I could program. Now with Volta, what we've done is we've taken that single program counter and we've literally given every single thread its own unique program counter, its own sets of stacks and information, all the tracking metadata that we use for it. And so now, all of these threads are wholly independent. They still work better if you gang them together. If I make a nice 32 word request from my main memory, I suck in a whole cache line or several cache lines, you know, my memory throughput's going to be better. You're always better if you can keep them together, but you're no longer dead in the water if you split them up. And so the net effect is that even though I can still write the same if-else clause, now I can make progress at different rates between them. It can switch backwards and forwards between the if and the else. In, in other, effectively, my program can diverge and become task parallel in a way that was tricky to do before because the things would get stuck behind each other. And that really is a much more natural way of wanting to program this machine. So, in a little map in, 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 in computer science terms, effectively, where we, we've gone from, you know, the CPU is your standard multi-instruction, multi-data type of parallelism, and with a SIMD data parallelism attached, what, we've done, what, we, what we call SIMT is how the GPU runs, where the threads are relatively independent, but if I was working on thread parallelism, I had to be lock-free on Volta. Now, any standard construct that you'd be used to in normal, pro in normal C programming, or C++ programming, is something can be expressed on Volta with, without any fear of deadlock at all. So finally, in the last minute that's available to me, I'm going to give you a quick summary of tensor cores. I'll, I'll, I've actually got to talk a little bit later this afternoon about CUDA 9, and I'm going to go into a lot more details about the programming model for tensor cores. But just to let you know what is a tensor core and where is all this power coming from. One tensor core is a matrix matrix multiply unit that will do a 4x4 four four matrix at blinding speed. And it will do that 4x4 four four matrix taking data in at 16-bit half precision, and it can produce a result either accumulating in 32-bit or maintaining it in 16-bit, depending on how your accuracy needs to be. 
right? So it's specifically accelerating 16-bit multiplies with a 16 or 32-bit accumulate. That's one of these tensor cores. Now, there's many of them ganged together in one of these chips. I showed you the, di the, the diagram earlier. And so the way that we expose this in CUDA is we say, OK, we're going to take a, war a whole warp of work. It's the first time we've done this in CUDA because we need so much data to feed these and so much power. All these threads are going to come in and they're going to gang together to present enough data for two input matrices, one accumulate matrix, and one output matrix. And all of those resources are going to come together. And I'm going to blast through a 16 by 16 matrix multiply in effectively a single operation, which is pretty amazing. And this is where all that performance is coming from, because the number of flops that you have to do to do a 4x4 four four matrix operation is, is considerable. Extend that to 16x16 16 16 for a whole warp, and this is why uh, Phil Rogers on the previous talk was talking about just how much your power lights up and how much your memory bandwidth slide up when you do this. And so the operation conceptually for it is two 16 bits to multiply, accumulate coming in, probably 32 for your interim accumulators, you might do your final output in 16-bit, and then finally a 32-bit result at the end. So, as I said, my talk coming up in about an, a half an hour, an hour, is going to cover the programming model for this, but there's a way to express all of this in CUDA, and I'm a CUDA guy, I'll tell you all about it next time. But this is where we start seeing these order of magnitude type speed-ups coming out of these cores. And so that's a uh, that, that, that's a pretty quick summary for you in just 20 minutes of some of the things we've done for Volta, but it is, it is an incredible piece of work, and you know, I've been lucky enough to be able to be one of the first people using them, and it is, it is, it is just a fan, it's fantastic to use and program these things. So there you go.